Caroline Jones. Tonight's story is about love lost and love found. Fifteen years ago, Peter Cooch was a successful stockbroker with a happy marriage, a young family and an exciting future. But all that changed in a moment. Peter was struck down with a rare form of stroke that left him paralysed with an active mind in a motionless body. Against all odds, he survived and prospered and managed to track down the one woman who'd always remained in his heart. This is their story. If I had a piece of clay and I could actually plaster or create a human being in all its perfect forms, he, that would be him. He was like, he was this character that lived in uh, London or maybe Paris or New York and he would stride into town because he was tall and athletic and drop dead gorgeous looking and he'd walk into a room and captivate and charm everybody. No one measured up to him, absolutely no one stood the test of comparison. I had never met, although they were, you know, good looking Italian men, but no one left that mark in my heart. No one left it. Once upon a time, I believed that financial concerns were the worst worries a person could have. I can't eat, I can't speak, I can move barely a muscle. I can write though, with a computer and just one finger. Each letter can take a minute to type. My hope in writing this story is that it will serve as a warning for other people who are striving relentlessly for the trappings of material success. He came from a very, very strong family. You know, his dad and mum and, uh, and brother Steve, uh, a particularly close family, but they had no silver spoons in their mouths at all. He's always been a boisterous little chap, loved, loved life, um, and uh, always an optimist. Anything that he puts his mind to, Pete can do. You'd come home from work, and Cooch would always say, let's go for a run. All of a sudden, he'd step the pace up and he'd turn around and he'd always say, no pain, no gain, let's go. And that's what he did. I mean, he just pushed the whole time. When Pete turned about 30, that's when he moved to Sydney and he began a career in stockbroking and uh, that's when he met Simona working in the same office. I first met Peter in 1980 and I was 21 and I was very happily married. I was working in the accounts section. I remember turning the corner and this amazing, gorgeous Greek god with his long legs that just seemed to have gone forever. And I just remember looking at him and just for a couple of seconds, our eyes met and my heart stopped. I was struck by her beauty. I became breathless and embarrassed. Behaved like a dope whenever I saw her. There was a chemistry that definitely there, but I was shy. I never wanted to project an image of me as a flirter or as a, di a disrespectful girl. But she was married, and I had a family of my own, and I felt my responsibilities very keenly. One Christmas party, I actually got to hold her for a dance. I remember that when he tried to dance with me, he tried to lead the way and he held my hands. And he gave me a very small kiss on the cheek. And that was actually the first time we ever touched and never again after that for 20 years. Are you ready to be? Peter left for London and then my life started to sort of fall to bits and pieces. Um, my marriage was in, on very shaky ground. I left to go to Rome for good. 
And for the next 20 years, I obviously had other relationships with other men, but I always thought of Peter as the love of my life. Pete was handpicked to head up the London office for a Sydney-based shearbroking company. He was seriously successful in the stockbroking business in England, and he had done very, very well for himself and his family. I attempted in one generation to do what normally might take several, to move from rags to riches. I was determined my family would have only the best. They lived in a lovely area. Well, I believe that he had a boat on the Mediterranean. It's important for a man always to come dressed properly to lunch. Daddy. This is going to nanny, you realise, Daddy. He was always doing something crazy. If it wasn't him something wearing silly. a bra, it was him you know, walking ridiculously. Voice. Oh, the funny walks. Yeah, the funny the walks funny were something walks. that... And he had such long legs. Pete used to push himself very hard. He certainly put a lot of hours in, uh, a lot of hours in. <laughs> I'd been experiencing symptoms that would typically last 24 to 48 hours. The pattern never seemed to change. Nausea, vomiting, headaches, and pain through my body. I often lost consciousness for brief periods. He had quite an exhaustive medical, and I know he was, he was very relieved when the results were very positive, and I tend to think that he was, um, he was concerned about something. Here's Pete, just before he falls off the bed. <laughs> it's the last we saw of Pete. <laughs> Pete was overseas and he was on business and typically he was exercising and uh, had come back to his hotel room to have a shower after his run. I turned on the taps and noticed that my left arm was shaking suddenly, violently, and then my left leg. I stumbled from the shower and collapsed on the floor. But try as I might, I couldn't make it to the door to call for help. The long long nightmare had begun. I had a call in the early hours of Sunday and it was Pete's wife at the time phoning from London to say that Peter was in the intensive care ward of one of the Singaporean hospitals. I was very worried, uh, extremely worried, and I was even more worried once I got there because uh, it was clear that Pete was in desperate, desperate strife. It was thought that he had a rare form of multiple sclerosis, but they weren't sure. And it wasn't until uh, he um, went to London where he, he, uh, the diagnosis was made. It's a very devastating form of stroke. And it's very rare, and only a very small percentage survive. It was a stroke affecting Pete's total mobility and power of speech, but left his mind intact. Well, that's why they call it a locked-in syndrome. Your mind is locked into a, a body which uh, really uh, is unable to do the, the most basic thing. And we were told that although Pete intellectually was completely unimpaired and his mind was not changed in any way, that he would never be able to walk, talk, um, eat and uh, that basically he would require sort of 24 hour support for the rest of his days. So virtually he was given no hope. I couldn't comprehend the long term implications. Not being able to move, not being able to eat, not being able to talk. Surely there must be some mistake. Pete was institutionalised pretty much straight away after he arrived back in Adelaide. Waking each morning to the realisation that this was not a terrible nightmare was quite awful. One morning I glanced through the charge sheets which were left within my field of vision and to my horror read the words, we nearly lost him that time. I got through the horrors a day at a time. Another person would have let go. I don't know whether I would have had the courage and the strength to leave such a horrible nightmare. I lay awake at night imagining the day I would finally drive out through the gates forever. 
without a plan or hope of leaving. My brain slowly turned to mush. I know he, from time to time, said, look, I, I can just feel that I'm slipping into this twilight zone and uh, it's not for me. And he did everything in his daily routine to ensure that he, he just didn't become, well, basically sort of in a vegetative state. It wasn't so much the things I couldn't do that were important, but rather if I was going to get out of this mess, I had to concentrate on the things I could do. You picked the cats to beat the bulldogs. I picked the bulldogs. Uh, that's one to you. I had brought with me from London an alphabet board and I had adopted the eyes up for yes, eyes down for no system. I-J-K-L, who plays? Which meant that I could communicate passably provided people were willing to use the board. Three, I, St Kilda. Uh, good question, St Kilda, St Kilda, St Kilda, uh, Carlton. Initially, he couldn't move anything, and uh, he developed a little bit of um, sensation that he could move one of his toes. This is how bad it was, and then he developed some movement in his right hand. Comfortable? Alrighty, ready? Easy ones? Once he was committed, Pete quickly set about ensuring that he had extremely aggressive physiotherapy. If my brain could not command my muscles to generate a movement, then repetition eventually would. You brought yourself forward, the straps aren't even holding you. I took absolutely every opportunity to exercise. I would sometimes do as many as 1,500 repetitions of a shrug-like movement of my right shoulder. Your cardiovascular, Pete, has improved enormously since you first started doing this stuff. You must feel this incredible betrayal when your body's just left you with nothing. So he, he had this kind of drive to pursue little movements. And that's where hydro was such a useful thing because water will kind of support and, and amplify any little movement. Water has always been a big part of Pete's life. I can remember as a little boy, he, um, he just, he'd just stay on the water um, on seaside holidays until he was blue in the face. He was a very proficient swimmer. Steve and Pete, I think, have one of the closest kind of brotherly bonds I've ever seen. Watching the two of them together, just quietly working away in the pool, um, and this, you know, this incredible um, brotherly love between them. So this is something that's really hard for you in dry land, but let's see how it goes in the water. He always said that he wanted to get out of the centre and have some form of independence in his lifestyle and in his living. You like towering over people. That's why you like coming in here, don't you? He certainly needs specialised care 24 hours a day, so I couldn't imagine how Pete could do this by himself. But he persisted and persisted, and he surrounded himself with some terrific people that uh, took on this challenge with him, and so he was able to, to move into independent living, as it were. In case you're wondering why I just didn't go home, my wife decided to live 800 kilometres away in Melbourne, and the family house was sold. And no, I didn't see it coming. No, I don't think it was an instant thing. I think, um... I think it was a gradual sort of well, set up. Yeah. And I think um, it was a really hard thing for everyone. everyone to have to deal with. It's sometimes difficult to realise the incredible ripple effects that these catastrophes have on everybody around them. I know that the world fell apart when his marriage fell apart and he was left on his own. I know that. He thought that was it. He was alone. He was. He was in the deepest darkness of it all. It would seem he'd be in a wheelchair, and he'd just be staring out to sea. And of course, we would see him, you know, and he couldn't hear us or see us, but he'd be, he'd be out there, and he might be out there for hours. That's, that's, you know, he'd just be out there thinking looking in the horizon, um, yeah. Pete, the girls have left your clothes already ready from last night. My life was scythed in two. Can you give me that hand? I couldn't repair the damage, but I refused to accept my productive life was over. 
I was desperate to break out and do something with this other half of my life. Why oh, these ones? You know, they're my favourites. The first step was to improve my self-image, and I threw away all my tracksuits. Pete engaged a PA, set up an office, and went there every weekday for seven years. And then Jeff tells me today the reason that my portfolio is going sideways and the whole market's going up is because I just don't have BHP or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Peter has always had uh, an active interest in um, global markets. That's yours, Steve. Right. Is that <laughs> And he produced a newsletter which basically gave commentary on, on um, global trends, um, where he saw the markets going. Oh! Just got there, didn't you? Oh! He'd have a, a little area there that he called uh, Punter's Paradise. And uh, I wish I'd only taken a bit more of his advice at times. <laughs> well, it's got, it's got some good ability. It has a great ability to come along. It was trying as much as possible to have a normality about his life. Maintain that uh, sense of standards and uh, keep exercising the brain. Pete's sitting. Pete's sitting. I'm sitting. But there was still a void. Over the long years, I had been thinking of Simona, thinking I had wanted to see her again. There might be a chance she was still single. Christmas 2000, Peter starts with, can you find this person for me? He said that he'd, he knew this Simona from 20 years ago when he worked in Sydney. What he knew was her ex-husband's last name and that she'd gone back to Italy 20 years ago after the divorce. <laughs> So this person called Simona is living in Italy. <laughs> We've got to find her. OK. <laughs> so there was the phone calls, and then there was waiting for the emails until I came up with the idea of the electoral roll. So it was 2001, and I received a phone call from my ex-husband saying that there was a colleague looking for me. And he actually said it was, it's Peter Cooch. He actually used the words, the poor bugger, he's in a wheelchair, he's a quadriplegic. My darling Simone, well, at last I have found you, and after just about giving up. And I remember starting this photo to see what he looked like. But he looked great. He looked great. I mean, you could tell that he obviously was not the Peter that I remembered. But, you know, even a lot of years had passed, I did not look exactly the same either. I wanted to see him. Two months later, I jumped on a plane. I landed in Adelaide not knowing. I had made a promise to myself that I was going to be strong and I was not going to show him that I was disappointed. But I wasn't disappointed. I saw this wonderful, human being. His charisma and his aura was there. It was, it was tangible. You could touch it. My mind was topsy-turvy on meeting her again after such an absence, and I was conscious of just what a shock I must have been. Hi. How are you? Enjoying the sun? Lucky today. Beautiful. And I just hugged him and I just said, I'm here. That's all I could say. What does a cop oscillophile collect? Steve came home and said, Pete's being visited by a friend of his, Simone Angeletti. And I said, oh, who's she? And Steve said, I have no idea. Which country is Africa? And we thought, oh, OK, you know, that's great. Nigeria! <laughs> And uh, we had them for lunch, and I'll never forget it. Here she comes, hello. And everyone was sort of on their very best behaviour, and, and um, you know, it was a very successful lunch, and she was very sweet. He asked me to marry him, I think it was about a month after I had been here. It wasn't long after that we started to have problem with the care, and Peter's entire care was up to me. Ready? Samaya was 
I think a little unprepared. She, she knew that Pete was a quadriplegic, but it was confronting for her. And I started to realise how hard it was going to actually be. OK. And all I thought was, you don't want to do this for the rest of your life. And, and I decided to go. I remember crying on the plane. I got to Rome that I was... I wasn't myself anymore. Life... Life... I, I want to say a, a word, I don't know whether I'm allowed to say it, but life sometimes... Life is beautiful, but sometimes it can be really a bitch. I don't think it was even more than three days that I had returned to Rome that I knew that I could not stay. I had to go back. I rang him straight away and told him, I'm coming back and this time it's for good and just get ready and get healthy because we have a, a wedding to plan. Now, Peter, as you place this wedding ring, you have put Simona on her finger. The wedding was the most beautiful day of my life. That she will always be surrounded by your love. Stephanie had organised for some rose petals. She had picked up rose petals from the rose garden and she had her daughters and people, the girls that were there, to throw petals at me. And I could feel the rose petals slipping off my shoulders and I had that sensation was just, a, I knew that that was going to be a beginning of something wonderful in my life, you know, just like an omen. Samara, you've won our hearts, and uh, I would just like to sing to you. Goodbye. <laughs> My feelings about Simona have been realised, and I know that I'm alive because of her, and I could so easily not be. There's a little touch of spring. Spring is in the air and everything's coming awake. From the very beginning, Pete always said that he would walk again, and he was always looking for opportunities to sort of pursue that objective. And we can start getting out again a bit more. He'd been following the debate on stem cell research, and he'd heard of developments from a friend. That's a you know, great surprise. They had contacted a doctor in a clinic in Rotterdam, and he had said that he would be able to give Pete some stem cell treatment. I was totally focused on getting those stem cells into me. Until that happened, I couldn't really pay much attention to anything else. It's controversial. I was worried that nothing would happen. And I was worried that maybe technically something would go wrong. What Pete can do with his hands. The stem cell treatment was very expensive. They did not make no guarantees. Obviously, for us, it was a leap of faith, a big leap of faith. Avoid any cuts or bruises or... He was injected with 1.5 million uh, umbilical cord stem cell intravenously. It will uh, distract the cells. Good. A few months after Peter started to notice that his physical stamina, the strength, was increased. You had to wait about 30 seconds in between stand-ups. Now you're straight up and down. And when he shook your hand, there was real strength in his grip. And that's something that he, up until that time, he hadn't had. He's able to hold his head up now uh, without any extra support. That looks good. But for a human being that has been sitting in a wheelchair for 15 years and hasn't even been able to really scratch his nose, it's an enormous step forward. A very crowded restaurant, preferably sit down. Hi, Julia. Come in, we're just filming. Hi, Molly. Hi. I have your Hi. books. Oh, great. Yes. Hello. Great timing, Julia. <laughs> I, I have them. My impression was for Pete that writing his story and keeping this record was his lifeline. So, there oh they my are. God. This is so exciting. There it is. It's your book. Oh. Good stuff. <laughs> this is your book. So much work and so much effort that he'd put into writing. 
to say it's painstaking is, is an understatement. This is happening. I think he thinks that it's in a dream. <laughs> of all the qualities with which I've had to arm myself, patience, persistence and a positive attitude have been the most important. They are such precious qualities. And so is laughter, the life-giving power of laughter. These are my lifelines. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is now launched. This stroke has brought me my darling Simona. This wouldn't have happened otherwise. It's also brought me back to my dear brother, a relationship forged over many years when we were much younger, in which I was in danger of losing, living on the other side of the world. Congratulations. Yeah. Wonderful. I hope my story will cause people to take stock of their lives and ambitions and give thought to their health and the well-being of their families. I know that we're both pretty conscious now of the need to take care of yourself. Take care of yourself and not get let ambition and stress get in the way. Plenty of people are locked into lives, aren't they? Hi. Ready to go? Plenty of people watch the clock tick by and the days scroll down and, and live a grim life, uh, but not Peter. Uh, he, he watched the clock for a while, but he, he had a plan. He knew how he'd get himself out of it, and he did. He did. He did. I realise there are many things I can't do, but I try not to think of them. This is the only life I have, so I'd better get on with it.